Oh, why, hello there. Now, before we begin today's episode, I just wanted to pop on here real quick and say that this podcast is made possible with support from folks like Brianna Burroughs, Emily, Harrison Campbell, Cassia, Caitlin Brown, and so many, many more. Those are just a few of my most recent Patreon supporters. Now, Nerdy About Nature is a passion project, an independent passion project from the videos you see on YouTube and Instagram to the podcast that you're listening to or watching here. And as such, I rely on support from folks like you to make it all possible. So thank you so much to everybody that has shown their support so far. Um, if you're not a Patreon supporter and you'd like to become one, you can do so at patreon.com slash nerdyaboutnature, or you can support this project through merch, stickers, and one-time donations at nerdyaboutnature.com. Now, at the end of this episode, I've got a special section, a, a brand new Patreon question and answer thing that you're going to want to stay tuned for. And uh, yeah, let's get into it. Here we go. Come and take a nature walk with me. We're going to check out some really cool trees. We're going to hang around and talk about all those things in nature that we can live without. Let's go get nerdy and yeah, let's get nerdy about nature. Nerdy and yeah, let's get nerdy about nature, baby. Nerdy and yeah, let's get nerdy about nature. Come on, let's get nerdy about nature. What up, everybody? Welcome to the Nerdy About Nature podcast. My name is Ross. I'm your host, and I'm also incredibly stoked to bring you today's guest, Miss Jessica Hutchinson, the director of Red Fish Restoration Society, which is a nonprofit organization based in Euclid, BC, on the west coast of Vancouver Island, doing all sorts of amazing restoration work in forests and watersheds to restore habitat for migrating salmon. Really amazing work here. Um, full disclosure, I actually work part-time for Redfish Restoration Society doing video, communications, and restoration work. So in a sense, Jess is my boss, but I invited her onto this program completely independently of all that work stuff because I truly just love the organization and everything that she's doing and everything that she's built. She's an incredibly inspiring, charismatic, optimistic person who knows an absolute cuss ton about this subject. Um, so really high quality nerdy content coming up for you here. Um, in this episode, we talked about forestry and logging, its impacts on our watershed, specifically on on salmon and all the things that redfish restoration is doing to restore habitat for salmon ending with some larger um, sort of longer philosophical takeaways for society at large towards the end of the episode um, quick side note here, if you're watching this episode on YouTube or Spotify, you're not going to be able to watch the whole thing because about an hour into it, the battery on my camera died. Real big bummer. Um, so it's either going to cut to black at some point or maybe I'll throw some nice vintage 90s like, you know, Microsoft wallpaper desktop stuff up for you to look at. You know, something to keep it kind of entertaining. And if you're just listening to the audio here, no need to even worry about that because um, it's just going to carry on just fine. So yeah, let's get into it. Here we go. All right, so welcome to the Nerdy About Nature podcast. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Why are you here? What do you do? What is it that we're talking about today? I'm here because you invited me, yeah. Ross. <laughs> 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 yeah, my name's Jessica Hutchinson. I'm uh, an ecologist and executive director for Redfish Restoration Society. Formerly Central West Coast Forest Society. That's right. I almost said Central West Coast. Yeah. yeah. How's that transition been? I think it's been pretty smooth. Yeah. And it's been well received. So that's great. Yeah. 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 We're really excited about the new chapter. Do you find yourself having to like, like reintroduce yourself? Like Redfish Restoration, formerly Central West Coast Forest Society. Like, does it just make it that much longer? No, I'm just deadpanning that old name. It's done. It's We're done. Gone. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, so I will start with a little bit of background on yourself. Um, what got you into this field and what you're doing? So how did you, where are you from? How did you get into forests? Um, so I'm originally from Vancouver on the mainland, British Columbia. And I, I don't know, I guess I always just had a passion for the outdoors. My dad was a, a bush pilot. He flew floats and him and my mom actually lived in Tofino here on the West Coast of Vancouver Island mm. back in the 1970s. And the heyday. In the heyday, yeah, of logging and, and all the resource extraction out here. And then they moved away just before I was born to Vancouver and... Um, We'd always come back anyways, and I, I just felt a connection to this place. And so when I was doing my undergrad at UBC, University of British Columbia, decided to come spend a summer out here and learn how to surf and maybe get a job and like ecotourism or in some sort of field that would give me some experience. And 
yeah, I just never really left after that. It just hooked me. Mm. And so you were going to school for ecology? I was. Yeah, I was doing an undergrad in environmental sciences and geography. Gotcha. And you worked as a, were you a forester for a while or? Yeah. So my first couple summers, I worked um, as, sorry, I can, it's. Uh... I know. If you if you hold the mic down, like go down a little bit further and then yeah. up a little bit. Okay. Sorry. I find like that'll help. Oh yeah. That's better. Yeah. It's less breathing. Yeah. You're not like, oh, hi. <laughs> Hi there, Ross. Hello. <laughs> um, so yeah, forestry. Yes. So um, first couple jobs I got out here were working in forestry, laying out cut blocks for logging. Um, it's a very entry level position in the logging industry, and um, I heard about it because I had actually worked at at Central West Coast at Redfish back in the day. Um, and like a summer job, a summer job on a restoration crew. And then one of the girls I worked with there and met on the crew, she had a job with this forest company and she told me about it. So it seemed like interesting work and, you know, did you need an ecology background to get into that work or was it just like anybody willing to like lay out cut blocks could go ahead and do it? That's right. Hmm. Yeah. Anybody. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, definitely. It was hard work. It's like hiking all day long oh, yeah. and you're on steep terrain and just the underbrush and the forest here is something to battle. And yeah, anyways, it was, um, it was my first sort of taste of, uh, the forest industry. And it was like kind of a really interesting balance too, because I was still working part time for Redfish Restoration Society And then also, so I was like repairing the damage, looking at like what a river and a forest looks like after 30 years post logging and then actively being involved in current logging. So it was kind of like a really neat like tanglement of um, past and present and and carryover from past logging. Right. And that gives you like a really good firsthand look at like everything. Do you think that that um, background and experience in working in forestry helps you today? Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Cause like you just understand how a road is built and how like why a cut block is made and how they harvested it and the different techniques. And yeah, I mean, I think it was such valuable experience. And then I, you know, connections I made through that still are relevant today, like with foresters and, and people who still continue to work in the industry, fallers and such. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, it was um, yeah, it was an eye-opening experience. And what was it like um, being one of the only, if, like the few, if only, female forester like out in that industry? It's a pretty yeah heavy machismo industry. From yeah, no, I can't say all those experiences were all that great. Lots of like crew boat rides in the morning with inappropriate people, and yeah, yeah, logging camps, and yeah, because this is like mid mid two thousands. Yeah. Early 2000s. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, no, it's, um, it's anytime a female is in a male dominated industry, there's uncomfortable situations and inappropriate behavior and yeah. Yeah. It's unfortunate, but. Do you think that's evolving and changing? I don't know. I doubt it. You know? I mean, 80% of the staff at Redfish is all female female and like, (laughs) like giving people jobs, like working in the outdoor spaces, like. I like to think that it's changing and getting better. Yeah, I do. I I think so. Like, especially in these communities. I mean, there's been so much rapid change here on on the coast. And so definitely. But whenever you get into those like work remote camp, male dominated worlds, that's that's going to be unfortunately, um, I would say probably continuing to this day. Yeah. Um, well, shifting topics just a bit, tell me a little bit about, because you mentioned these like coastal environments. Tell me about these coastal forests, these coastal environments. What makes them so special and cool? Yeah, they are amazing. They're so biologically diverse. Like you, you don't need to be an ecologist to recognize the, like biodiversity. This it speaks for itself. It, every square centimeter inch of the forest floor is covered in 50 different plant species and and they're all like actually connected like physically and like at all levels they are connected so um i think it's an amazing place for that like for something to be this like biologically species rich is 
is an amazing thing. And it's also like when you're working in restoration and you're trying to restore something that's been damaged, like we're very fortunate. Things want to grow here. Things want to recover. And all we have to do is sort of like help it along, give it that little helping hand to do that. And, and um, yeah, so it's, it's an amazing place to work just for, just for the diversity alone. And what kind of stuff were you seeing um, in these cut blocks and in these second growth forests that you're going out into? Like what, how is it changing? Um, well, you know, logging can be done in so many different ways, you know, like these forests have been managed by the nations for thousands of years mm -hmm. and they cut trees down and they did it in a way that you would never have noticed that, that they were harvesting, that you would never know that 10,000 people lived in this community and harvested from the forest. So, um, which and, says a lot because the town of Yuki right now, I think is just over 2000. Yeah. So 10,000 people's yeah. significant population. Exactly. And, and for them to harvest for thousands of years, and yet it still looked mm. um, like a beautiful, amazing, healthy, abundant forest. Um, and so, I mean, that is like, that is the perfect scenario. And then, you know, then there's a clear cut. And so, and I think I've kind of worked in all scenarios in between. So, I've, you know, I've had time in old growth forests that have been harvested and managed by the nations for thousands of years. I have worked in a cut block and seen like some bad logging practices. Mm -hmm. And then I have worked in something in between where there has been some like you know, shelter really... wood kind of variable retention. Exactly. Yeah. Where there's care and attention and longevity of understanding that this forest is going to continue and that there's these magnificent candelabra cedars that can right. be retained and we take certain logs, but not others. So I think um, I've had the opportunity to see, all the different types of logging that can occur and um, the good and the bad. And so, okay, so getting exposed to that process is kind of what got you into restoration. You have a really interesting uh, thesis project that I heard about like years ago, I think, like doing oh, research no. for another film. Yeah. Huh. Um, would you like to talk about that? Because it's still like one of the coolest little plots of land, I think, around here where you can like literally see the differences and the changes and see how restoration can work to, to yeah. rectify that. Yeah. So the point of my thesis was really to look at like, is restoration effective? Does it work? Can you take a second growth forest that is a monoculture plantation? All the trees are the same age. There's lots of them. There's lack of understory vegetation. It's dark. It's dense. Super tight. The a lot of ladder trees fuel. Trees are growing all yeah. tightly dense together. There's a single f canopy layer. There's no multi-layered canopies. There's no young trees and old trees. So can you take that? And then can you take an old growth forest and look at all the diversity, the, the different species of trees, the different heights of trees, the understory vegetation, and can you try and create that? So I tried to measure whether restoration can effectively achieve that and get some of those old growth features happening in second growth forests. Um, yeah, and that's something we try to achieve with restoration, and it was something I tried to measure through my thesis work. And, and I, what what kind of like old growth characteristics does that include? Like so, um, so you have again, canopy gaps, like yeah. different standing like dead wildlife trees. Yeah, bigger spacing between each trees to yeah. allow light down into the forest floor. Standing dead trees, like I'm sure behind me, there must be a tree that's still standing up, There's but three. is dead. Yeah, so that's something that you don't see in a second growth forest. So try and create that. Um, lots of these old growth trees will have crevices and cracks in their barks, which are really important for bats and, and even nesting birds. Um, so we try and create that in a second growth tree. Um, what else? Trying to create, increase the amount of large woody debris or coarse woody debris on the forest floor. Because in an old growth forest, a tree falls down. Downed it, logs. Yeah. It's downed. It's there. Um, but in a second growth forest, usually what they've done is they've clear cut it. Then they've slash burned it. So they get rid of all that coarse woody debris on the forest floor. So just trying to increase that. Um, yeah, there's lots of really cool techniques. Topping trees, um, slicing cavities in trees. But so getting into this, yeah. like, because when did you do your thesis? 2011. 2011. Had much of this type of work been done? Like, were you kind of writing the rule book? Like, you're, you're going out looking at this, like, 
horribly overcrowded, packed second growth forest and being like, how can I fix this basically? Mm -hmm. So were you kind of coming up with the tactics? Like, no, I think maybe I was trying to come up with the monitoring, like how Mm. can we measure this? But definitely the tactics were sort of like developed in the 1990s. So only, you know, 20 years prior, but unfortunately there was a lot of investment or fortunately in the 90s, there was a lot of investment in research and monitoring it towards restoration. Mm-hmm. Um, but that sort of died off after the 90s. And so there hasn't really been a resurgence. Why, why did that happen? I think just a change in appetite and government. And mm. there was more of a focus in the early 2000s on conservation and less of a understanding of the importance of restoration as a pillar of conservation. Hmm. So, but I, I see that change now. I see like there's definitely people are talking more about restoration and the importance of like, mm-hmm. we can't just abandon these places that we've wrecked. We need to go back and look and see if there's things we can do to make it better and help its recovery. Totally. Because like it will recover, but it's like time frames that are thousands of years. And yeah, as human species that only tend to live about 70 yeah. Like there's a lot more work that we can be doing. Totally. And and like, then if we think about these ecosystems as like they've never just been standalone. The nations no. have always managed them and tended them. Totally. Then they shouldn't just walk away. There's no such thing yeah. as like a park that's untouched. It right? is managed by people like like clam beds. Clam beds are an amazing example. Mm. You can have a beach and just have the clams grow on it. It's not going to be that productive, but the nations tend the clam beds and they're actually significantly more productive. So right. we have to think about our forests and our rivers in that same way that that they have been tending them for thousands mm-hmm. of years. And that is what has led to their productivity. Totally. And with the clam beds, I've read a thing where it's like on low tide lines, they bring rocks out and like establish a shelf so that mm-hmm. more mud would collect behind that during high tides. So they'd have like larger clam beds to like operate in. Totally. There's like all these kind of like micro modifications to the, to the landscape, but it's like no different than a bird building a nest in a tree. It's like, yes, humans are just a bunch of wild animals out in these ecosystems too. Yeah, like, And we understand them. So right. we know what they need. And mm-hmm. so with river restoration, it's like we know the river needs wood. We know that that's an important system and function for the river. So, you know, that's what we're trying to do is bring that wood back right. into the river because unfortunately it was taken out for logging purposes. Yeah, for logging purposes. And it's funny when you think about that. I heard a really beautiful thing the other day that was um, talking about like ancient Western Red Cedars, like even these ones behind me here, like they're not like the oldest of old, but there's like a certain like Western science quote unquote in this part of the world has only really been here for like you know people like white people quote unquote studying these trees have only been able to do that for about 100 150 years maybe Mm -hmm. they've been doing them beyond just like cataloging them and then you hear stories from like indigenous nations who talk about like the twist of cedars coming when a cedar loses a limb and the the cedar like grows over the next couple hundred years to rebalance its top and that's what kind of creates like some of these cool features that like from a quote, again, quote unquote, Western perspective, we don't know how those have evolved because we just haven't been able to witness that and study it mm-hmm. versus like these nations and communities of people who have like lived amongst these ecosystems and like literally watched that tree grow from a sapling over thousands of years as a community. You know, like you get to know these things beyond just like the kind of like mindless um, resources that Western society tends to put on them and they become like they are beings, you know, you get to know them on such a deeper scale. Totally. And I think that's why like at Redfish, we really believe in like stewardship and Mm. like connecting people, getting people outdoors and be a part of the ecosystems that they live in so that you do have that like naturalist perspective and you get to watch that tree grow up and it holds a special place in your heart and you look after it and you look after the land, you care for it. Um, I think that's like, we just need to tie that connection back in. Yeah. I think, and that's like a really important element of like, of stewardship is becoming like <clears throat> naturalized in a sense to the lands. Like there are trees around here who I've been like, you know, looking at for years. And then like, a, you know, there's one um, where like a branch, a limb ripped off in a windstorm. And it's like, oh, like the day I saw that, it was like kind of like tragic or jarring but then like since that time like you can see that limb on the ground starting to like soften up and decompose and start to become a little bit of a nurse log a little stump for something else Mm -hmm. it's like really awesome to see that happening Mm -hmm. it is yeah Yeah. i know and okay so funding dried up in the 90s was that related to uh war in the woods up here 
Like, is that why I'm thinking back in the nineties, no, what happened okay, so that like, like the, promoted, like got a lot of money into that. So that would be it. Yeah. yeah. So war in the woods, there was, a uh, um, the government at the time, uh, was like focused on trying to get jobs created. Mm. There was a downturn in the forest industry initially post war in the woods mm-hmm. and the forest practices code came in. So significant changes were occurring. Um, which kind of set back the logging industry a little bit. So in order to keep people employed and working, a lot of investment into restoration, silviculture, forest recovery initiatives. And so that's where our organization sort of came out of that time. A whole bunch of individuals got together and we thought, hey, yeah, we, let's do something about all this damage that's been done. Mm-hmm. So our organization was formed by like First Nations and biologists and foresters who all wanted to come together and make that happen. Um, so a lot of funding around in the 90s, like I said, early 2000s, everything sort of dried up, uh, change in government, change in objectives. Um, when I first started with the society back in 2005, like it was, I remember just looking for grants and funding and mm. nothing ever said restoration, planting trees, like it wasn't a, really on anyone's radar. Um But then things have started to change recently, and it seemed like a much positive turn happening. And so that's where the origin of Redfish came from. Yes. Um, Tell me a little bit about the history of logging in the Clayquot Sound and and the need to to start up an organization specifically devoted to restoration and restoring these lands. Yeah, so logging out here, as I said, nations have been managing and harvesting Mm -hmm. for thousands of years in the 19th. 30s and 40s, like some small scale logging, uh, mainly marine based where, you know, they'd have a barge and fallers and they would, you know, log directly from a shoreline. Mm -hmm. And then tug it as a raft elsewhere. Yeah, exactly. And then come the 1960s, everything got more mechanicalized. I don't know if that's a word. Mechanized. Um, Mechanized. There you go. Thank you. Um, And everything sort of accelerated. And this is where we see like entire valley bottoms logged bank to bank. Um, And then things got even worse in the 1980s. Um, You know, industries advanced. Things got even more mechanized. And so now they've harvested the valley floors and now they start harvesting the upper watershed. So those steep fjord Mm. mountains around the valleys. Um, And uh, yeah, so that was the 80s up until about 1995 and then everything changed. And then what kind of issues does that type of logging or does that kind of systematic approach to landscape management create? Yeah, so it was like a double whammy. So first you have taken all the old growth the most like those trees were huge along the banks of the river because of the salmon the salmon are Mm. massive nitrogen providers it's like fertilizing your forest every year um and so we take all those trees away and that was what was holding these valley bottoms together because they're just composed of loose gravel so once you take away that root strength of the trees Mm -hmm. the these rivers and we get a lot of rain here on the coast just Mm -hmm unraveled so we have what used to be narrow single channels that were deep and uh, filled with like pools and and large trees that had fallen in and now we don't have any of that and what we have instead is like just a very wide shallow um, gravel laden river um, that is you know in some cases two to three times wider Mm -hmm. than it would have been historically and because we continue to get these massive rain events, the river just changes from year to year, which it never would have had that same mm-hmm. fast rate of change when there was big old growth monumental mm-hmm. trees holding it in place. And then come the 80s, like I said, they started logging the upper watersheds. Um, so now we've we've lost all that stability in the lower watershed. Now we're making water come down fast and furious. Because mm-hmm, there's um, no longer any forest to like no slow. Long. There's no interception loss there's or no, retention. Exactly. Just, like a forest in the mountainside, you know, it's going to it's gonna intercept water. It's going to mm-hmm. suck it up. It's going to slow its like migration down. Without trees up there with just bare soils, you're going to have that water just make it to the river that much quicker. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be really even a flashier river. You're going to have massive amounts of landslides and so that's the other thing and now we've had these landslides that are just inundating the river with gravel and cobbles and Mm -hmm. sediments and 
It's just a real mess. And most of those uh, landslides are triggered from logging roads that kind of switch back these mountainsides. Yeah. I've seen like a lot of photos. And even still, you can like look around on some hillsides across valleys where you can see, you know, like some deciduous trees kind of in like straight lines kind of going up along those logging roads. And you can just see like swaths where it's just like a vertical column all the way down to the to the river below where it's just like a landslide would have occurred and there's like slow restoration occurring on it mm -hmm. like a lot of deciduous trees but it's all stemming from logging roads mm -hmm. the logging roads exactly yeah they just cut this linear straight line through the slope of the mountain on all around the valley mm -hmm. and then that just like they cut them too deep back then they just built them really poorly they ditched water that should have had a culvert they did it cheap mm -hmm. and bad and it just created a massive amount of slides um, from the logging roads that make it all the way down to the river and bring with it all the sediment and because they log there's no trees either like landslides are natural um, they happen all the time on the coast but they occur in old growth forests so you can imagine a landslide with all these massive trees Mm -hmm. It's not going to get very far. It's going to jam up quickly. The trees right. are going to hold the sediment back. Um, they very rarely make it all the way down to a river edge, um, but that's not the case without those big trees. Yeah, it's it's wild how fast um, the kind of the baseline shifts. Like I think prior to me like reading stuff and and kind of understanding this like. A lot of people will drive from um, east side Vancouver Island, like out to this part of the world, and they'll be driving around Kennedy River, and it's a gorgeous river. But like even looking at that now, um, you know, back in the day, it's like, like wow, look at this picturesque mountainscape. There's trees on the hills, check. There's a mountain or there's a river, check. And there's like all these cool gravel sandbars, check. And you like look at it, and you're like, it's this nice, wide, flowing river that just like looks super picturesque. But that's not how that river would have existed historically there would have been it would have been much smaller narrower those big gravel bars on the side wouldn't have existed and you can see like all the erosion like happening on the sides of those banks like they're all mostly alders that are coming up but they're not there long enough to like really stabilize the soil by the next time that the river starts to meander so it's just like trees going in all the time it's just this completely yeah. different ecosystem but no totally. one would ever know that no it oh, looks pretty. So people does. are like, oh, this is great. It was lovely. Why would you want to restore it? Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's a lot more complicated. And, and yeah, you just have to think that these salmon and these trees that were thousands of years old, the genes mm -hmm. of the salmon are that old and they've all formed right. together. So when you mess what up, what that salmon needs to survive, um, you've, they, they doesn't have the capacity to adapt that quickly, change things way too quickly. Yeah. And I think that's where like, I often hear a, a lot of arguments where people are like, oh, but like things are always changing. Like things just need to adapt. And like, this is part of the change. Like just let life kind of find a way, which like, yes, life will find a way. That is the thing, but it's, it's the same thing with climate change. It's the fact that things are changing too rapidly for things to be able to adapt. And when like fish stocks are already at like the lowest numbers in recorded history, um, you know, there's like, there are things that are just like, that rely on these ecosystems that can't adapt that quick. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's, that's the time crunch really is mm -hmm. if we didn't have salmon just dropping off at such a fast rate, like it would slow the pace that we need to do the restoration. Like maybe we don't need to hit so many rivers to restore them all very quickly. But the mm -hmm. fact of the matter is, is that salmon populations in Clackwood Sound are at an all time low and they're at that like tipping point that mm -hmm. if we don't start creating some habitat that they can actually use and that they will will be stabilized enough that their their reds make it through the winter their nests can survive and their the young salmon can actually get out to sea um yeah we're just working on time scales right now and unfortunately the rate of change for these rivers is too rapid and um and salmon are just disappearing at, at an alarming rate that we need to do something now. Mm -hmm. And so like the Tranquil River, that whole project is, is a great example of like the type of in river restoration work that's being done. So old growth forest, narrow, deep channel, um, lots of woody debris, things holding the riverbanks together, lots of deep, cool, shaded waters for salmon to um, migrate, to um, feed in to, to live their lives. But basically that has all shifted to now shallow, wide rivers, lots of gravel, um, nothing, not a lot along the stream bank. So there's like not as much shaded water. Mm -hmm. And so what's some of the work happening at Tranquil? 
like if you could describe that whole situation yeah, and what for sure. so what like, Redfish has done. Okay, you're you're a salmon, you're coming back, it's the end of summer, it's been you're a salmon. You're, you're salmon. swimming up. You're swimming up the river. You get to the river and you're like, Oh, it's really it's filled with gravel and it's very shallow mm. and the like the fall rain hasn't come yet. It's still a hot late August. Um so your migration corridor yeah. has been messed with. It's it's shallow. It's wide. There's like a ton of bears waiting to get you. And then and so there's you, no hiding spots in those bears. So yeah, it's just easy picking. Exactly. There yeah. used to be a big log here that I could hide under. That's not there anymore. There used to be a pool like mm-hmm. 500 meters up that I could like race up this shallow section to get to. Well, that pool's in filled too. So there's no pools for them to hide in. Mm-hmm. Um and then, so then, okay, fine. Let's say you make it to your spawning grounds and you're going to start like digging your reds and finding your mates. First off, there's probably not a mate for you. Uh, if you're lucky, you do find one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the, the pool is pretty uh, shallow in that sense too. Um, so then you make your red, you hope for the best, you die. And then come the winter rains, fast, furious climate change is not helping the scenario. Mm-hmm. Chances are your red is just your your salmon nest that you've buried in the gravel. It could just wash out. Mm-hmm. We have intense rain events post uh, with this climate change. We also have really intense flashy rivers because as we talked about, the water is getting there mm-hmm. so quickly with these second growth forests um, and with these roads and everything we've created in these watersheds. So good chance your gravel's washing out and your red's not even going to make it. Um, if you do survive and you make it to become a juvenile and you're going to get out of the, start making your way out to sea or you're going to rear within the river, is there groceries? Is there food for you to mm-hmm. eat there? There's way less salmon coming back. There's way less nitrogen input. So you're going to have less bugs. There's no old growth trees. How, how, how does that connect just really quick? Because oh, salmon eat bugs when they're juveniles? No, no. The lack oh. of nitrogen. Oh, well, nitrogen is just this like booster, right? And we talked about how it's yeah. a, like it comes from the ocean. It's a marine derived nutrient. Um, when a salmon dies, it's this massive nitrogen source that is a fertilizer that uh, the carcass of the salmon itself would break down. Mm-hmm. It would drop that nutrients into the, it would also be a source of like, you know, for the larvae itself right. that the, the juvenile salmon feed well, on. And that nitrogen is a key ingredient in creating um, chlorophyll for photosynthesis of big trees. So you exactly. need to have that nitrogen input. Yeah. yeah. And then also you don't have the big trees growing along the sides of the river. So you don't have the bats that are flying up and down the right. river that roost in there that drop their like fecal matter into the mm-hmm. river, which is another source of like nitrogen and, and anyway, and nutrients, so, yeah. and nutrients. So you're missing all these things. So you're a juvenile salmon. There's nothing to eat. Maybe there's no big trees. There's no big trees. There's no shade. You're kind of exposed. It's quite, you know, there's no <laughs> overhanging vegetation for you to hide in. Oh my God. This is such a dramatic novel right now. <laughs> Someone needs to make a movie of this. So anyway, how is Disney so not how, jumped on this? The salmon we, coming back. How do we restore that? So here we are. That's Tranquil River or he'll suck this in, in the Chalna and how do you restore a river that so what we do is try and we're trying to get trees growing back on the banks of the river we're doing we planted like 30,000 trees if not more maybe 40,000 trees in the last three years in that watershed alone so trying to get the trees back um, we are putting wood back into the river we're doing these really cool engineered log jams that don't require any cable or boulder they're just a mess of wood that has been engineered in such a way it protrudes out into Mm. the river like that toothpick game where there's marbles on top of the toothpicks and you're pulling them out I don't know that game you don't know that game? no I feel like I should Uh, it was it was a childhood game yeah I can't remember it was like I don't know what it's called. I just remember there, there's like a bunch of marbles and you have toothpicks in like a jar and you're trying to pull out the toothpicks, but basically the log jam of toothpicks keeps the marbles from oh. falling. And if you're the one who pulls the toothpick that causes the marbles to drop, you lose. Oh, nice one. But yeah, so it's like that. They're basically just a bunch of logs stuck together that keeps... Yeah, and the bank of the river it sticks out the, into the river. The marbles of the soil, of the river bank from yeah, falling. Yeah, it protects the river bank from mm-hmm. being eroded by the river. It gives those juvenile salmon a place to hide as they make their way out. It cre- Because it's sticking out into the river, the water hits it. And that creates like a scouring motion, which creates a pool on the downstream Mm. side of our of our structures and then that pool is used by those adult salmon that are looking for that place to hide and rest as they make their way to the spawning grounds 
Um, what else does it do? It actually like it sticks out far enough that as the the gravel is moving, as we talked about how these mm. flashy systems actually make the gravel mobile, it slows that and it helps sort the gravel a little bit. So you mm-hmm. can see around a log jam, there'll be like finer like sands and sediments sorted on one and side and lighter gravels and cobble. So and that's alluvial deposits. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Where the water slows. Yeah, so it helps like sort the gravel and yeah. create more of a diverse yeah. ecosystem and geomorphology. Oh, geomorphology. <laughs> <laughs> so today's unpaid ads for folks doing good things in the world goes to the Tolokwiat Tribal Parks. The Tolokwiat Tribal Parks guardians tend to the intergenerational gardens, which include the largest intact coastal rainforest on Vancouver Island, and the Tribal Parks allies provide experiences which connect to that story and support the collective vision for a culturally and ecologically rich coastline forever. So these allies are businesses or individuals that operate on traditional Tolokwiat territory, and every ally agrees to support the tribal parks by contributing a 1% ecosystem service fee on behalf of the First Nation, and these contributions are reinvested in the people and the ecology that comprise the life of this place. It's a really rad program happening that serves as a model for what's possible all throughout Turtle Island, and you can check out more at tribalparks.com. And now, back to the pod chat. Before we go any further, you've been mentioning this idea of a red, which is a salmon nest. Mm-hmm. Red which is our new fish name. restoration yeah. society. So, um, explain what is what is a red? How does it come to be? And like, what type of because of salmon can't just nest in any gravel; gravel. it needs certain deposits. So, yeah, every species of salmon. There's five species of Pacific salmon, and and they and trout as well um they all require a different size a different mixture of gravel they're very specific about their gravel uh, mm. desires and the position <laughs> where the gravel is within the river um they're female salmon you know so they're fussy and uh that's really the, what they go <laughs> for they look and they find the best gravels they just want to nest they so just want to nest and then um so the female salmon will build the gravel uh, nest um, and and deposit her eggs. They will be fertilized with the milt of the male salmon or multiple male salmon. And, um, and then the, she'll defend the nest for the days or weeks that follow until she perishes. Um, so she'll try and keep predators away. Sculpins will try and get in there mm. and, and eat the eggs. And so these beautiful little scarlet red eggs... Um, hundreds to thousands of them are deposited in the river, um, in the bed of the river, which is um, a dangerous place to, to make a nest, right. um, especially in a logged watershed. So, but we um, chose the name because there's so much hope, like every red, like with holding thousands of eggs in it is like a very hopeful idea. Mm. And um, you know, as we talked about, everything is influencing that red, like the forest, the mountains and the water and the climate and the health of that salmon, whether she came back a giant, like, you know, six-year-old Chinook or five-year-old Chinook or six-year-old Chinook, um, or did she come back like a three-year-old, you know, mm-hmm. like how many eggs she has is a, a determinant of like how prod- how productive the ocean was. So to us, this, the red, it like really symbolizes like this, the connectivity between all these ecosystems and the importance of like a healthy ocean, a healthy river, mm-hmm. a healthy forest is all going to influence the health of, of our salmon population. So, um, it's complicated. It's so complicated. It salmon are an impossible thing to try and manage. Um, but we can do it. Can we? I think so. The nations did it, you know? Yeah. I think we just need to sh- shake things up and do things differently. And change, I guess it's changing. Management practices. Well, practices and priorities. Mm-hmm. It's just like forestry. Like when you look at a forest and value it just for the timber, that's all you manage for, then like, yeah, you can do that once, maybe twice. But then as soon as you start to take into account all the other like ecological factors or, the, or cultural, all the other things that depend on all these other stakeholders who don't have a voice at this table, mm-hmm. then the idea of sustainability and like managing a forest takes on a totally different role. It's the same thing with salmon. Mm-hmm. If we're like trying to just put as much food on our plates as possible, like yeah. we were 100 years ago, then like, yeah, we can do that like once fast really well. And then it like, you know, creates these like these stories of old times, you know, when you could stick your hand in the water and pull out two fish, you know, there's mm-hmm. like, like, yeah, you can do that. But when you start to 
again, look at like the ecological factors and like, and valuing it for different, different values, then all of a sudden the way you manage something has to change. Yeah. Like, are we managing salmon just to harvest them? Is that the only value we see from salmon or do we recognize that salmon have like a critical value to all the ecosystems, Mm -hmm. um, the Pacific ocean ecosystems, the terrestrial and the freshwater aquatic Mm -hmm. ecosystem. So like what, yeah, what is our goal? Well, and that's funny too, because it's it's such a can of worms. Because as soon as you start thinking about salmon, that like nothing exists in a silo, right? So then all of a sudden you have to look at forests and roadways, travel, like cause, cause contaminants is a big thing. Development yeah. is a huge thing. Like there are so many different factors that affect just the salmon. So you can't just look at them as a silo and be like, how are we going to manage this fish stock? And change the way we do this, but then let everything else kind of continue status quo. Mm-hmm. Like we need to, in a sense, change everything mm-hmm. in a way that betters just the fish. But then as part of that, like um, our forests, the communities that we live in, like jobs, it's like all this is job creation, you know? Mm-hmm. I know. And again, not to like toot our own horn or anything, but I think that's where like organizations like us, like mm-hmm. Redfish, like really do play a really key role because like, you know, we are the go between for like Ministry of Forest and like the logging companies and the harvesters and like we all have to work together. You right. can't have these silos um, to effectively manage a species that is interconnected between everything. Like you need to mm-hmm. have some sort of like um, or, or I'm a really big fan of like round table management or local level management, anything that like sort of tries to bring everyone together right? Um, for like a, the same cause. Cause everyone does really want salmon populations to be healthy and abundant. That is a mm-hmm. very common goal. Um, but it's like, it's the getting to that goal and the, the work that's required. Yeah. Well, and I think too, like uh, there are so many different aspects of it that aren't necessarily salmon focused like maybe you don't eat salmon maybe you don't care for fish like fine you still probably want like a healthy forest land you still probably want to have like a buffer from landslides wildfires like flooding like that's what the forest is going to give you Mm -hmm. you want to have like health of the ecosystems that surround you that you like live amongst because that's going to ultimately like improve your quality of life whether or not you care about salmon yeah, definitely. Exactly. I mean, we all drink water. We all, right. all that water comes from an ecosystem, comes from a watershed, which likely on the west coast of Vancouver Island, this lower portion is supports Pacific salmon. Oh, we got some people we walking some. by. They'll they'll figure it out. Yeah. I feel like it takes a rare breed of person to walk between a camera and like <laughs> and <laughs> people in front of the camera. Um, <laughs> tell me a little bit about the restoration economy. And the idea of the restoration economy. Yeah. So I guess it's like, again, it's like about shaking things up and doing things differently. Um, right now we have really like our system of management in British Columbia, like other places like Oregon and Washington is that, you know, you have this like upper management control of forests and lands and rivers and and <laughs> <laughs> and it's more like a resource-based extraction economy how can we build economy from this come on hey in you guys are welcome to pass oh, oh and i just walked right in front of the camera i am blowing it um right so okay, sorry. resource-based economy right where you're pulling trees out you're harvesting that's what your... we live in now a resource yes. and yeah. you want to move to or we sh- yeah I think it's worth considering where we move to like a restoration based economy where we're looking at like, how can we make things plentiful and abundant enough that we can still like, you know, sustain ourselves Mm -hmm. without that like greed and development and consumption based Mm -hmm. economy and it's more about trying to create something that is plentiful sustainable Mm -hmm. and properly managed and so for me i think step number one is bringing it back local i feel that like you know you can manage uh maintain a a little creek in your own backyard if Mm -hmm. you have control and you are the one planting the trees and you are the one and you have the know-how you have the know-how you're the exotic species because they look cool (laughs) (laughs) 
but you know, like it's harder for, for you to like manage, you know, um, a Creek that's in someone else's backyard, 500,000 right. miles away. Like you can just see that that is a lot. So I feel like we need to make that shift back to, and for me, I think it's back into the hands of the nations. And that's why I'm a big fan of guardian programs. And, um, like I said, stewardship and putting, um, the onus back at the local level on the management of our forest rivers right. and seas. So I think that's like, um, an important step in, uh, in achieving a restoration based economy. Well, and even like when I hear or think of the term restoration, restoration economy, what does it mean to you? Ross? I mean, I, it's, I feel like it's, um, uh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like it is very much a transition type economy. <clears throat> it's like the economy of today slash the past has been very much resource greed driven, like mm -hmm. resource extraction, looking for that. And we know, I feel like collectively as a society, consciously, like we know that we need to do better, mm -hmm. but how do we get there? Mm -hmm. And so like, then there's the future economy, the one where all of a sudden there is none of this greed or like we're, we're working with reciprocity on these lands and in these ecosystems to both live sustainable, healthy, fulfilling lives, but then also not do it at the cost and expense of everything that we mm -hmm. rely on. And then restoration economy is kind of that in-between where it's like, how do we generate jobs, create economy, mm -hmm. um, keep, keep people employed, build strength, build and strengthen communities, but doing it in a manner that rehabilitates and restores the mistakes of the past. Mm -hmm. So it's like, essentially like, you know, it's picking up the pieces mm -hmm. to not build the same thing again, but to build something better in the yeah, future. Definitely. It's kind of that like transition state. And exactly. Like, and it's not going to say you're not going to still be extracting or no. utilizing or, you know, but it's just doing it in a more mindful, sustainable, mm -hmm. locally based way so that, you know, we're not clear cutting. We are not harvesting an entire watershed. Mm -hmm. We are, you know, taking what we can and understanding that it's done in an effective way that it's actually positive and it right. can actually have a, a benefit to the ecosystem. Yeah. And, and the funny thing about today is that this, there's so much opportunity for this, mm -hmm. like forests and fisheries, agriculture, like everything, mining, like there are so many different ways that we're operating where it's like, hold on, if we just like step back, rethought how we're doing this and like, yeah, prices might go up in some things, but that's, you know, in a free market, that's just going to generate opportunity to do things better or for the brands or companies or whoever's operating to do that are doing things better to have an upper hand as everybody else kind of struggles to adjust. So it's totally. like, yeah, progress needs to look different than the progress. I feel like we've defined it as in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. And I think like... Um, kelp um kelp farming yeah, yeah it's huge. like a great example of how right. like that's like an amazing benefit to the ecosystem like juvenile salmon love kelp forests they use them um and through like over harvest of yeah. um sea otters you know we've decimated the mm -hmm. kelp forest because the urchins that had, were able that the the otters eat and the kelp forests then right. were impacted by the explosion of um the fur trade yeah well, like the fur trade is what the fur trade is what took out the otters, took out the otters which... and then without the otters the, the urchins. urchins got going crazy and then we lost the kelp forest and so <laughs> yeah. it really messed things up yeah and without the kelp forest and the juvenile salmon are just sitting ducks and they mm -hmm. have nowhere to feed and rear and grow big and yeah it's funny um i guess i've never thought about the salmon element of that story because, like, often when I've heard it, you know, you hear it's, like, kelp and otters. Yeah. And, and how um, creating, like, more kelp forest ecosystems, like, you know, um, it reduces the, the, like, swells and storms that hit the beaches. So, we yeah. have, like, maintained beaches and stuff. But then, like, it, you know, provides habitat for otters. But I've never thought about the implications for salmon in that yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. No, juvenile salmon. Yeah. It's, like, an important rearing ground. And, and all and, sorts of bait fish, like her herring. Oh, like, definitely. Like, yeah. yeah, it's an, if you ever get the opportunity or maybe you mm -hmm. have to swim and snorkel in a kelp forest. No. It's so beautiful. I would and it's love to. so, like, yeah, it's just like the rainforest. They're so ecologically diverse. And, yeah, juvenile salmon utilize them. And so when we reduce the number and the distribution and the density of these kelp mm -hmm. forests, you know, it's further for a salmon to make it between the next kelp forest and so yeah increased risk of predation mm -hmm. and there's good news in that field though i feel like the 
the field of kelp farming is yeah is booming right now. And otters, like I went on a whale watching tour the other day, and we saw more otters than anything else. I around know. Here. And when They're I everywhere. moved to Clackwood Sound in 2001, there was. You know, on a lucky day, you would see a, because my first job in Tofino was working at Jamie's Whaling Station and I was on the <laughs> Leviathan and you would be lucky if you saw uh, an otter. Like it was such a rare and now it's, you know, they're, they're everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. It's crazy. Great. Yeah. yeah. And that was just from a reintroduction program mm-hmm. in Alaska. Alaska. So, yeah. So and they've made their way. So, I mean, like ecosystem species can recover. We just need to give them that helping hand. Right. And... Yeah. And again, that's like a restoration based economy. And, mm-hmm. and then think of all the tourism, like tourists love oh, yeah. those little sea otters. They're just so darn cute. I know. Well, and it's funny, like thinking about forests, like you go through Cathedral Grove and it's just like a gong show any day of the week. Mm-hmm. There's like cars parked, double parking cars along the side of the highway. And it's just to take your photo in front of like a big tree because it's so incredibly rare these days. It's like, how is that not factored into like mm-hmm. a lot of decision making nowadays? Know. Like. Yeah, it's such a privilege to be even to be able to get to some of these areas because it's they're so remote now. Like the where mm-hmm. these big trees exist, like are usually either accessible only by helicopter or like four wheel drive or not at all. Mm-hmm. You know, so like yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's and it's funny too when you think about the timelines that it takes. Like I don't know the lifespan of otters, but to see like an otter population rebound, that's something that we can witness within our lifetime. Mm-hmm. To see a forest go from like a uh, young developing second growth forest to a healthy mature primary forest or like mature complex forest ecosystem like that takes thousands of years like yeah let alone like even if you get a tree that's 1500 years old the ecosystem's not that old like it needs to grow that old die fall over create sort of pit and mound topography that's going to allow for other things to grow and so Mm -hmm. it's like this massive gap in like i guess to me it just seems like a really lofty ambitious goal because it's you have to commit to it knowing that it's not something that you will ever reap the benefits from yeah but you do see it i mean like you like things grow so quickly here like Mm -hmm. we go back to my master's thesis and we look at a a restored and then the control sites the sites where we did no restoration dense dark second growth that hasn't changed at all looks exactly like it did in 2011 and then you go to the sites that we restored And it's not an old growth forest, but it looks like strikingly similar. Mm -hmm. So there is that like, I think that's what helps us, you know, in the restoration business is like, you can like see it happen and you're like, yes, this is, this is better. We did make a difference. Yeah. I know. I remember when I first went out to where you did your thesis, because it's cool. It's along an old logging road and on the left side. It's just like super dark, dense forest. And on the right side, like you can visibly, like you can look at the second growth forest and you can turn 180 degrees and see like, well, that was 2011. So in in 10 years time, the amount that that forest has like Mm -hmm. rebounded back. There's like all sorts of huckleberries starting to come up and stuff. Yeah. And you can hear it. You're like, oh, there's songbirds on this side. Right. And we got nothing on this. Side. <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> it's just. It reminds yeah. me of those like um, kind of dead, dark forests that you see in like fairy tales. Mm-hmm. Which yeah, is, like, like the one of... you wouldn't want to get lost in. Yeah. Where you're like oh, Hansel and Gretel. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> which is funny because I think most of those um, originate from like Germany and Europe yeah, area, where which it's, like, would have been second growth forest. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, no wonder you're terrified of that. That is a horror story. Yeah, exactly. No yeah, one they wants are... to go in there deep dark but yeah nothing lives in there either so it's probably an okay place to be really there's no deer you know so then there's no carnivores there to eat the deer it's true i never thought of it like that yeah you're probably safest (laughs) tons of mushrooms budding up yes lots of mushrooms yeah Yeah. all the dead and decaying wood there um just looking at my notes here i've got so many things we've kind of touched on i'm glad you're not texting me over there i was wondering if you're uh... yeah i'm just this (laughs) conversation is so boring right now (laughs) i'm just mindlessly scrolling instagram right now (laughs) oh so let's talk about flow regime because um relative to climate change like there are like every river is unique and it's sort of like annual flow regime of whether that's like snow based or rain based and with climate change, like we're like the river systems here are obviously more rain based because we don't have like glacial snowmelt mm-hmm. that's contributing much to them. Um, but I guess just like overall, how is climate change impacting like restoration work on these rivers? Like not just here, but like across the province, across Turtle Island, like mm-hmm. 
Or we have because we're having to calculate, like, or I guess, like, adjust for the changes that are inevitably coming. Yeah, exactly. It seemed to be really quickly coming too. Mm. Um, so we're seeing like more intense rain events in the winter time, uh, which is you know in a recovering watershed, that's not a good thing. Um, you're going to increase that rate of change. That river is going to be able to erode its banks quicker. It's going to be able to shift quicker. Mm -hmm. It's not going to give the time frame we need for these young second growth trees to like grow up strong and tall and develop the root system. So we're getting more intense rain events, more frequent intensity of rain events. So what used to be like a 50 year storm or a yeah. 20 year flood event is now happening at a more regular basis. So that's, um, that also affects salmon too. So like, you know, back in the day, if you had like a hundred year or 50 year or 20 year flood event, you know, that's going to affect a single cohort of salmon mm -hmm. that one year. And then three years later, you're going to be like, Oh, our returns are really bad because three years ago when those eggs were in the gravel, they all washed out from that 20 year flood event. Right. But now we're getting those 20 year flood events every year. So it's yeah. affecting every single cohort of salmon. So every year. So that's why uh, at Redfish we're doing, uh, we're going to be doing a red uh, scour survey of the Tranquil River uh, coming th this coming summer. And we're going to start like monitoring how frequently is red scour occurring that we're seeing this washout. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's happening is, um, like you said, we don't have that snowpack too. So if you are a system that's dependent on snowmelt um, to get you through the summer and to get you through um, that low flow season or the dry season, that's not there anymore. Mm -hmm. So we're and even if you're a rain dependent system, like a lot of our rivers and streams here on the coast. Um, we're having drier summers or dry, longer dry spells within a summer period. So uh, last year was a perfect example of that with the heat dome. And then mm -hmm. um, we basically didn't have a, a drop of rain from uh, mid-July till the end of August. And um, yeah, water levels are low. So if you're a juvenile salmon rearing in a river, you are likely perhaps in a segmented pool. There's no longer right. connectivity. You can flow, move up and down a river. You are stuck in one small pool. And we see that everywhere. Um, in some systems, because of logging and the inundation of gravel, you know, your water subsurface and entire uh, creeks and rivers are going are dry. Like mm -hmm. there's water way down, but you've lost it at the surface. So um, like last summer where I found this like one, the day before I was there, there was like a section like from here to the tree away filled with water. And I went back the next day and it was dry. And there was just like little salmon everywhere. It just dried up. And mm. these like American robins just going to town on them. <laughs> Um, yeah. So yeah, lower flows, hotter temperature to salmon have a real, like, um, you know, they have a small window of temperature that they can withstand mm -hmm. or, or handle. So, um, withstand and yeah. So we're seeing warmer temperatures up to like 22 degrees, like lethal temperatures for yeah. salmon in rivers, which is really unfortunate. Wait, the water gets that hot? Yeah. 22 degrees? Yeah, the wow. lower tranquil. We had a, um, a oh temperature logger in there last year. It was 22. That's so warm. Yeah. It's like bath water. It is, yeah. And so if you have, like, you know, that's just where our temperature logger is. So you hope that, you know, there was enough connectivity within the system that the salmon could escape that and move away from right. that one yeah. hot spot. But it obviously it's not the only hot spot in the system. Well, and I mean, out here on the coast, like, I don't want to say that it's insulated. But like, I feel like the change is within a threshold, but then moving like slightly more interior where there are salmon runs or people trying to rehabilitate salmon runs like up the Columbia per oh se. Oh my gosh, yeah. And it's like you have like a snow melt and glacial based regime and all of a sudden it's getting warmer faster in the end of the winter. So those rain events come melt the snow from the Alpine down. So you get like flash floods that come down the spring. It's no longer like sustained through the spring. Mm -hmm. And then the reducing glaciers and like that's like heating up faster so that those are melting now through the summer and less into the fall. So then you have like once those glaciers disappear, there's going to be no water running there's in the fall. Be, and there will be no capacity to support right. salmon. And, mm -hmm. you know, without addressing climate change, there's not anything mm -hmm. we can do. Like there's no there's no solution to that. But, you know, addressing climate change. Today's second unpaid ad for folks doing good things in the world goes to Hornby Organic. 
a family business that makes organic and gluten-free energy bars originally on Hornby Island, now operating on Vancouver Island. These things are absolutely delicious. I swear I take them with me everywhere I go. The chocolate espresso energy bar is insanely good as well as the oatmeal raisin one. They're incredibly nutritious and delicious, pack away easy, and are much better than like your average, I don't know, whatever the options are on the market. These things are hands down the best. Plus, they're made locally. I 10 out of 10 recommend picking up a bar for your next adventure. You can learn more about them at hornbyorganic.com. Now let's get back to that pod chat. Um, talk to me a little bit about um, forest interception of water and how that how that impacts um, water levels in rivers. Yeah, so... Um, we kind of talked about it earlier. I think we did, yeah, didn't yeah. we? We could talk about it again. I mean, just... <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, like... Does it really interest you? It does, But it yeah. does. Like, I mean, like, all of these is just... You know, if I was to scrape away all the plants all the and the water moss. was just to right. hit that bare soil... Like you can watch these YouTube videos if you want of like, it's called like raindrop erosion. Like it actually has an impact and mm. like creates like erosion. Like a you splash can, that yeah, sends dirt everywhere. Yeah, you can visibly see. Um, so, so there's that, but like. I'm going to Google that. Yeah. <laughs> then, uh, <laughs> but like these, these plants also have, like they're going to absorb some of the water. They're going to transpire some of the water. They're going to like infiltrate the help sorry the help the water infiltrate mm. slowly into the soil they're going to uptake uh, yeah i i've read an interesting thing um in something that i was reading a bit ago about just how like conifer forests um like intercept lost more water than deciduous trees mm -hmm. and like all the conifer forests here it got me thinking like have almost in a way adapted to like ward off some of the water mm-hmm because um there's so much well yeah so there's like through fall that comes through the branches that lands on the understory mm -hmm. um there's stem flow which only happens after a certain amount of like water that flows down the stems of trees and stuff that only happens once enough rain has fallen that has been intercepted loss from the branches and all the understory um and that can that can reduce the amount of rain that falls into the soil by like 30 percent which sounds like a little amount but like relative to the amount of rain that we get here like that actually is enough to like yeah. right yeah or significant so then like that just reduces the amount of rainfall that allows to like be soaked into the into the soils that allows for that to kind of flow like through down like hillside slope um what am I saying? The flow through the, the slopes. But then when you Subsurface flow. Subsurface flow. There you go. So then when you cut all that down, then all of a sudden there is none of the trees or anything that really like aids in that. So then 100% of that rainfall is falling into the soils. So it's almost like these forests have evolved to like almost stay dry or to keep the water out of the soil so they can maintain stability. Yeah. Yeah. Nope. It's true. You said it. Th that just <laughs> that blows my mind because it goes back to like... um some of the the concepts that we talk about about humans being part of these ecosystems and that like for so long we've only ever looked at a forest as just a cluster of trees mm -hmm. but it's so much more than that and when you start taking into account um all the mycorrhizal mm -hmm. networks like all the stuff that suzanne smart has gone about discovering and finding out about the way that these forests interact it's almost like they have as like a, a being in a sense or a community mm -hmm. evolved for the betterment of everything in them oh definitely and it'll shift like every, you know we don't we think of forests again on this like macro scale we're like mm -hmm. oh this is a hem ball forest it's got hemlock and balsam and that's that's what we're calling <laughs> it but like every little micro system within this is different and it's right. adjusted to the different hummocks and the way the water is subsurfacely flowing like i see skunk cabbage right over there so that's right. obviously like a wetter depression that holds water better where water flows poorly through the substrate mm -hmm. and that's created an ecosystem around it and then because of that we have more you know of trees that are able to deal with um with higher water volumes like, like cedars, cedars yeah. exactly Exactly. And we're not going to see that hem ball, which we're going to see over there, which is on a bit of a more mesic conditions with a bit of right. a slope where water's flowing better. Like it's all so unique and so different and all adjusted to these. So, I mean, so again, nuanced. that comes back to that local level. Like right. you need to manage things at the smallest scale so that, you know, yeah, we understand those that connectivity that exists. So it's not a good idea to just cut this down and plant the same species of tree. No. The same two species. 
Yeah. Or the Maybe same. Three. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we either see like they, when they started logging in the sixties, they didn't even actually replant. They just let it, whatever seed was in the ground came back and uh, hemlock, they just, you know, they just proliferate post logging. Mm-hmm. So most of our second growth forests that were logged in the sixties around here are pure hemlock stands. And there is no natural disturbance on the coast that would create that scenario. You mm-hmm. know, like we don't have fires. We don't have massive valley-wide blowdown events. We have blowdown patches and things like that. Like nothing would create that. So, but that's what we have. We have entire valleys, um, pure hemlock, all logged within a, like a five-year period. So all the same stand age. Um, or, and then, so they didn't actually start growing uh, cedar in nurseries in, in British Columbia until the eighties. So um, they weren't even actually planting cedar until the eighties. And so they were planting a lot out here as Douglas fir. Cause that was like, that was the money winner yeah. back then. So we have a lot of these weird second growth forests that are all Douglas firs and it'll be like this swampy land that a Douglas fir would never grow yeah. in. No, we've got a lot of them. So those and are they're just like odd fighting ones to get to, by. Yeah. And so they, it makes it for a weird restoration project because you're like, okay, we got to thin some of these Douglas firs and get some other species growing in here. But um, it's going to take a while for those mm. to get back to a natural. But then with climate change, you're like, well, maybe these Douglas firs are actually okay right. because things are getting drier <laughs> right. and it's not so swampy anymore. Uh, I know. And there's a lot of the, there's a lot of talk around assisted migration, which like, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it. Like people bringing coast redwoods and stuff up north. Mm-hmm. I mean, like I understand the principle of it, but it's, it feels a little bit defeatist to me. Yeah. No, I, I'm a, I mean, we take our direction from the nations, the, mm-hmm. the indigenous uh, leaders are what giving us our priorities for restoration. And, you know, cedar is always going to be a right. priority for the nations. It has so much like cultural, um, economic, uh, s- s- like benefits, spiritual, the, spiritual, right. everything. Yeah. Um, social so um yeah we are definitely still planting cedar and we're just trying to find plant them at the micro level so we look at each individual planting site and say like okay where here are we going to have enough summer water mm-hmm. during the low flow period to sustain a cedar that's not just going to go red yeah and die which a lot of those like second growth stands of cedar that you see around the hillsides especially after the heat dome like a mm-hmm. lot of them are dead and drying out because totally like It'd be different if those those cedars were growing in the understory of a mature forest or something. They weren't just clear cut, but you know, you essentially like alter the microclimate when you clear cut it. Um, it raises the temperatures. There's not as much interception loss, so it's like drier. Definitely, um, the water goes away quicker. Yeah, so like that cedar may have been able to live there had it been you know growing up in the understory of like a mature forest, but because it's planted there now, and there's nothing else around it to help give it that microclimate that it needs to survive that damp, cool air, it's gonna like dry out mm-hmm. and die. Yeah. Yeah. Cedar is actually our most challenging to plant because Mm -hmm. we also have this problem with um, deer. We have um, black tailed deer here on the coast. And because we were talking about those dense second growth forests where there's no understory vegetation, that's your entire hill slope. So the only place the deer, there's actually vegetation for them to eat is in these like these riparian corridors along rivers where they're alder dominated and um, that's where we're doing all our planting. And And riparian, just for people who don't know, it's forests along a river or creek. Yeah, exactly. The riparian sort of describes the river and the forest. It's that like space of interconnection where you can barely tell the river from the forest and you can tell, can't tell the forest from the river. Anyway, so that's where our focus of our restoration and planting activities are. That's where the deer are. So we have to like cone our our um, cedars so the deer don't eat them. And we also have to, um, yeah, really choose our microsites carefully for cedar plantings and make sure that they're going to survive and we don't come back the next year and they're all yellow or red. Um, what role does industry play, you think, in the restoration economy? Like the forest industry? Yeah. Um, or like what do you think can be done from like a management incentive perspective, like those second growth forests of hemlock that are all hemlock dominated, Mm -hmm. um, restoring them would be amazing. 
um, especially if people were to go through and log them in a way that like opens up some of those canopy gaps and allows for other species to grow and thrive. The problem with hemlock is is that it's like low market value. Nobody wants to log it. Yeah, exactly. And if it does, it gets turned into toilet paper. All usually. Yeah, so. and then when you're in trying to do restoration, it is really hard to actually like some groups have looked at it, and I've looked at some like um, restoration slash logging things that they've been really innovative in Japan, um, and they do sort of like corridor strips, so like kind of like a, a just enough to bring a feller buncher in and yeah and it's <laughs> yeah. like slice and it you know you can get creative and you can create openings and you can like when then those openings that you've created as long as you haven't like compacted soils and you've mm. done it in a, in a proper way other groups have looked at like horse logging too right um so things that like don't compact soils and get your logs out um so yeah there is things you can do mm-hmm. you can get creative it's funny. I've heard a lot of um, like some logger friends who have been like, oh, you could never horse logger, like um, bring back skid roads because it damages the roots and the soils. And it's like, yeah, it might a little bit. But like compared to clear cutting. Yeah. Like, really? <laughs> You're going to be compared no. Compared to yeah. a skidder? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. No. No, there is a way. It just has to be a will. Mm-hmm. And, it, you know, and, and we've created these markets that are dependent on clear cutting. And so until we shake everything mm-hmm. up a little bit more and. Um, there won't be the will. So I guess my question to you is like how, like what role does industry play in like kind of creating this new, this new management style of forestry? Like, is there a way that we can make it more economically feasible to do those like radical new ideas to like thin out these second growth forests? Like, yeah, I think there's so much hope and there's like, you know, people are, that's the thing I love about humans the most is like, we're really you know, we're, um, we have great ingenuity. Like we can Mm. develop things. We can, we have ideas and we can find ways. Uh, so I feel like there is hope and, and a lot of the nations, the indigenous nations here are starting to take control back of their lands and their forests. And so I think there's amazing opportunity on the horizon for a different way of doing things. And I look forward to like working with each of these nations in our region to sort of like, brainstorm some ideas and find ways that we can do things differently that um you know support Mm -hmm. an economy at a local level but and provide jobs and connect people to ecosystems and and restore them at the same time um i think it can be done it's just you know Mm -hmm. we have to use that ingenuity Mm -hmm. i guess kind of leading into a wrap-up question here like are you optimistic for the future i'm terribly optimistic (laughs) You can ask That's... anyone who works with me, yourself included. Yeah. I am very optimistic. Contagious optimism is needed these days. Yeah. I feel like it's the only way, you know, I might be on my deathbed and be like, "Whoa, I was wrong. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, until that day, I, I you know, you got to be optimistic. You got to like root for change. Um, you can't give up. There are so many brilliant people and mm. And, and people who are, are brilliant and passionate and, and, you know, we find each other and we will and uh, find solutions and make things better. What do you hope to accomplish with Red Fish Restoration Society? Um, you know, so many things. I hope that, um, you know, I can I create opportunities to connect people to watersheds. I hope that, you know, we leave watersheds in better places than we found them. I hope we expand knowledge within the region about um, different systems and what those systems need to recover. Um, I hope that I can do things that um, support the nations, um, the indigenous nations in their, um, management of their lands. And I hope I help the communities. I don't know. <laughs> just like everything, I, I, everything you yeah. know, well, it's all connected. You can't do one without thinking of the other. Yeah. Yeah. It is all connected. And we like, if we want like healthy communities, we need to mm. make healthy ecosystems and sustain healthy ecosystems. And yeah, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I hope my journey's just beginning and i'm definitely learning every day and every year and yeah it's great well i think that's like a really important thing for people in whatever field they're in today to like be conscious of is like moving forward like you can specialize in something sure but like there's a level of specialization that almost like (laughs) requires arrogance where you don't think of anything else and like we really need to be conscious of like the impact it has on 
not only other individual humans, but like broader ecosystems and the wildlife and the future generations who are going to inhabit this place, not just your kids or your kids' kids, but like seven, 10 generations from now. Mm -hmm. And it's a really difficult thing to do because our systems in, within our society have not um, trained us to think in this scale, to no. think about all this. Or even our culture. Like I had the opportunity last night to go to uh, the tribal parks allies for Klaw right. Nation. And it was amazing. And um, Saya Maso, who's the lands and resource manager, gave a talk about ancestors and about how all of our ancestors. And I was like, wow, that's not even something in our culture. Like, I don't mm -hmm. even think back to my ancestors like generations and generations and generations ago. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a connection to like my great grandparents and, and the stories of their parents. But that's probably about as far as it goes. Mm -hmm. I don't really. So I think it's about, yeah, it's about this changing our mentality about like, how we are connected backwards mm -hmm. and also forwards too, that we have this obligation to like, I mean, you know, like I am no saint. I need to remind myself of like, mm -hmm. of that too. Like our make the conscious decision in every day to like mm -hmm. think about the future and the impacts that those decisions are, are having. Well, it's like the society of today has been so, enmeshed in the now yeah it's like yolo mentality yeah right? yeah like consume buy mm -hmm. make yourself look good right. and then show right. it off so other people want to do the same you know like <laughs> yeah. it's uh and we all get caught up in it yeah. you know i love a good online shop like the next person but you know like <laughs> where i do that online shopping and how often like well, and it's funny, this is like reoccurring themes coming through the previous podcast episodes, um, because so much of like that shop that you do online and like not guilt tripping you. No, no, means, you know? okay. Everybody no, does it. Everybody shops online. It. <laughs> but the negative <laughs> impacts of that has been so well hidden from us that we don't even see it. Yeah. Or when we do become made aware of it, then there's all sorts of like greenwashing or marketing campaigns that come about like um, doing better, giving back, like all yeah. these things. It's like, when can we as a society evolve to a place when we no longer need to give back because there's nothing to be bad, there's nothing bad or to be ashamed about in the first place, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, it's true. I mean, so I was writing this article the other day for our periodical and I was saying like, you know, we're our organization, a charity and I'm proud that we're a charity. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, should I be? So I did a quick Google sh search on like the history of charities and how like ingrained they are in the capitalist system mm. and how a charity was developed in order to like bolster the continue on with capitalism, but then feel like you're giving back. And I was like, oh God, maybe I'm not. I shouldn't be proud uh -huh. of the word charity. Yeah. And then we're just like. I had no idea about that. Yeah, me either. Anyways, I'm still proud that we're a charity, but I was like, oh, that's too yeah. bad that we are really just like a way so people can carry on, you know, buying, consuming, yeah. but then also like. I gave 20 bucks to. Therefore, yeah. I, you know, wash my sins away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah. That's unfortunate. <laughs> a lot of that is and so deeply rooted in Catholicism, too. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, a lot of it did come back from mm -hmm. like, I can't remember, the 1700s and yeah. The like, you know, the poor, the rich trying to help the poor in some like philanthropist way, mm -hmm. which wasn't actually fixing the problems. And so that was the, what it, like the mm -hmm. article really came back to was that like, as long as the charities are trying to get the root cause of the problem and not just like creating Band-Aid solutions. Well, and in a way... I mean, not to get too deep and heavy on it, but it, in a way, it kind of depends on the continuation of like a very well-established class system mm -hmm. where it's like the very few rich people like, oh, here, take my measly pennies here, yeah. like feeding the lower class so that they can afford to like live quality lives or, or yeah. you know, being sold this idea of like the American dream is like this thing that you aspire to when it like really the people in control are just like, you know, you're not paying your employees enough. You're not, yeah. the causes of poverty to go aren't to being addressed by just giving them like a couple dollars yeah. to buy a lunch. Like you're not actually like you're not fixing building or bridging like any sort of real equality. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And so I guess like as a manager of a charity, I guess, you know, like, and you have to reflect back on like, okay, so are we as an organization getting to the root cause mm -hmm. of the problem? And I like to think that we are, that we are doing these like band-aid fixes that are maybe mm -hmm. like putting logs in a river. And, but we're also like working at that local level with the Ministry of Forests and with like industry to say like, okay, let's not do that again. Like mm -hmm. let's change the mm -hmm. practice so we don't 
uh, create these problems or work with the nations as they move towards managing their lands to ensure that like better protections are afforded mm-hmm. in the future. And well, yeah. and and on a on a personal like individual level, what do you think people? What is the most important thing for people to do to help build that or further that idea into the future? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think everyone knows. So you mean like, like what can? Am pe- I giving advice to people that I don't? Know? Oh, I mean, <laughs> maybe not. Let me think about how to rephrase that. Maybe I'm just trying to think. Like, what what is it? Do you feel that is like the most important thing um, for an individual in this society to kind of think about differently moving forward? I don't know. Maybe we should move towards like thinking less about ourselves and more about the like the connection like you know the, the Chalnath nations have this mm-hmm. Hishak Isawak which is like everything is one so like you know that is much better than the Instagram selfie culture that we're moving towards of like me 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 what's best for me and like think about like what's best for us what's mm-hmm. best for this what's best for like this understanding of collective betterness mm-hmm. um which is much harder to achieve, you know, like, um, yeah, I think that is really maybe the route to go is start thinking less about ourselves and more about how, you know, on a daily we could try and make things better for everyone mm-hmm. and all things around us. I mean, you're talking to a guy who's kind of made a thing out of selfie videos. Oh, so sorry. It's, <laughs> no, it's fine. <laughs> I know it's... <laughs> I'm not yeah, happy yours about is, it. Like for a good reason, you know. Like yeah. you're not like, <laughs> you know. I, yeah. I I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. It's <laughs> it's funny because <laughs> Didn't it's even think about that. Yeah, you know, it's funny because it's a thing that like I've gotten into just be, like so serendipitously. I'm like, yeah, I'm sure. Fuck it. I'll record a selfie video and like be that guy. Like whatever. If like the the overall goal is so much bigger exactly. than that. Exactly. Exactly. You're not like selling lip gloss. You're right. You know. Or yeah. Or anything else that people sell on yeah, Instagram. Yeah, no, I you're like educating people and creating knowledge yeah. and awareness, and you're, you know, you're talking about things that matter. That's it's different. Yeah, it's just funny because, uh, like, if I had it my way, but we, I, I wouldn't even be having to do that. Like, I hate. No, I'm like feel like in every video I post, I'm like trying to design my way out of this like quote unquote job. Yeah, like basically create a place where there's no need for me to tell people about how cool this stuff is. <laughs> like, but at the same time, okay, as much as like the new world is tough and like it is very, you know, it's also this amazing opportunity to like mm. connect. Like I remember, you know, in the early 2000s when you would like, you know, you try and like, you know, spread awareness or knowledge and how hard that mm-hmm. was to do. Like there wasn't these opportunities to like get information out there and connect with like thousands of people right. through one post or something like that. So I think like it's an amazing tool and we just have to like, and it's an amazing part of our culture. We just have to use it in the right way. Mm-hmm. And- well, I think that in a way goes back to that kind of class system that I was talking about. It's like taking power away from like the corporations and the people who use it for the evil elements, mm-hmm. quote unquote evil, you know, yeah, and, and getting back to like the community building individual like benefits and like yeah. stop playing into the system of like using it as a way to like further your business and sell yeah. more things. It's like, are you connecting with people? Are you establishing good relationships? Are you, yeah. are you growing? Yeah. Are you having difficult conversations with people who maybe don't align with you and agree with you on yeah. everything you have to say? Like get out of your echo chambers, you know? Yeah. I think that it's really been dangerous in that regards, especially like recently with the divisive politics and stuff. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, and it's catered in a way so that it makes it so easy to stay in your echo chamber, but oh, it's yeah. really, it's bad in the long term. Like we need to be able to have conversations with our totally. neighbor who doesn't agree with us. Like we all still shop at the co-op. No, like, I know. But the algorithms, they keep mm-hmm. us in our echo chambers. It's so weird in that way yeah. too. So we aren't reaching the people. And sometimes I find that too. Like if we do like a post or something on social media, sometimes I'm like if we're going to promote it, like like messing with them to be like, do you want to find people in your area with similar? And I'm like, no, I want to find different people <laughs> right. who would never, ever ta- think about salmon. Let's like connect with them. Let's right. show them what like an ecosystem looks like and why it's important <laughs> yeah. to protect. Like it's... But no, it's going to send to like the fly fisherman or the, yeah. you know, the avid hiker. The people who are already like engaged it, and bought on. Yeah, who they've yeah. like synced mm-hmm. you with. So, 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, I had one other thing that I wanted to talk about. We, we kind of like lost the moment, but going back, you were talking about um, just like Nicholna, the connection to the land and this concept of everything being everything and, and ancestors and stuff. Yeah. Everything is one. Everything is one. Um, and this is a note that I talked with Indra about in the podcast prior to this one. Oh, lovely. Um, but just this, this idea as like settlers on this land, it's... Um, like there's no amount of money, there's no amount of things, no amount of anything we can do that will ever quote buy or get us that type of ancestral connection that like indigenous peoples on these lands have and have like, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that we can't move forward in a way that naturalizes ourselves to these environments and like working to like, like we talked about earlier, just like get to know the lands you're on. And I think for me, if I were to like be in your position offering advice to anybody listening, I think it really is as, as simple as like getting to know the dirt under your feet, like going on a walk around your neighborhood. And even if it's not the most picturesque scenic place, like getting to know the tree on the corner and like mm -hmm. becoming familiar with the lands that you reside on. Cause like ultimately it's those lands that keep you living. Yeah, definitely. And getting to know the nations that have managed yeah. them for thousands of years too i feel like that's such an important thing and something that i like really have enjoyed uh, through my work and my career is the opportunity to engage with all these different nations and and communities here on the coast and and yeah we're never going to have that same connection to the land but um but we can find a connection in our own way um that respects um their their ownership and their management mm -hmm. and um, but still creates a, like a connection for ourselves here. And, and I think you can, you can very much achieve that by just like, you know, spending time outside. Mm -hmm. And through Redfish, it seems like everything that everything within the charity organization that you've helped foster and grow to this point, like that's very much about that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we have like lots of people who work for us who are primarily desk job folks who are, you know, writing reports or grants or um, doing mapping. But we try and like everybody tries to have some field work days too so we can like get people out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it's very important. And obviously we work with each of the nations. So a lot of our staff comes from the nations too. And we try and build that indigenous knowledge into the restoration process mm -hmm. um, and into like understanding these watersheds better. And to clarify that, it's not like you're just like, quote, working with nations like a forest company would, where it's like, you've gotten consent, so you're going to go do your thing. Oh, no. It's like very much like... Oh, it's like a daily. Yeah. yeah. No, we're like constantly working with individual fisheries managers or forest managers or with their field technician crews mm -hmm. or of the different five nations within just the occluded tofino kind of peninsula yeah exactly just within the small area and there's five nations we work with each of them on their projects and you know there's like upper management that we're working with who are defining goals for and priorities and and things they would like to focus on to like you know providing you know, staff training and employment and professional development mm -hmm. for 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 their technicians or uh, fisheries managers or yeah so it's like a very much engaged entwined um uh relationship that we have and you know it's something i'm very proud of that um we've developed such great relations with each of the nations and and it's like key to our success too right i feel like from a pure business model stance that's like something like really admirationable admir admir admirable 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 mm -hmm. about the organization is that like yeah aside from like all the great restoration and ecological work you're doing like just the that business model of like working so closely with these nations and like providing employment and engagement like mm -hmm. that's something that like every business should be doing yeah definitely yeah and like our board of directors has a representative from each of the five nations so my bosses the board has um has a member from each of the nations their representative um sit on that so like we're having it at all levels right down to like our our junior field techs are from the nations and um yeah i mean it's I, yeah it's like a, a business model that i'm very proud of and um and one that i'd like you know i just think it's uh, for the best for for everyone for us as an organization for us as a charity mm -hmm. if we're getting back to those root causes of problems for the future and um yeah maybe even for the ancestors too i'll have to think about that one yeah 
Well, it's incredibly awesome stuff. Stoked mm-hmm. to be involved. Stoked to be having you here sharing these thoughts. Yeah, Is there anything you. else you'd like to add? No. Or chat about? Um, no. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a mm. real pleasure. I could chat all day. I know. So <laughs> I guess to finish up, where can people go to find out more about the work that Redfish Restoration Society does? Um, yeah. So we have redfish.org. It's R-E-D-D, double D. Which is a red salmon yeah, nest. Yeah, salmon nest is a red. Not so. a red colored fish. Yeah. Although it is a bit of play on words because yeah. they are a bit Ooh. red too. <laughs> Um, so yeah, redfish.org, um, to find out more about us or, um, at redfish restoration, if you want to follow us on, um, on your phone (laughs) and, uh, yeah, or, you know, and find out about again, like the nations in your areas, the, the organizations that are working locally. Um, there's so many great stewardship groups out there, um, so many great conservation groups, um, so many amazing nations doing, um, different projects locally. So, um, if you're not from this area, definitely get involved, find out more and, um, yeah. Yeah. Tread lightly. Tread lightly. And I think on that note, just to expand, um, on different local events, like Redfish puts on all sorts of different, like there's a planting day happening on Sunday for, which is probably when this episode will go out, but for the triple plank. So there's like, all sorts of different like inv- events where people can get involved on the ground and like help out. Totally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. We have um, events throughout the summer. We have a little store in Euclid. So if you're visiting the coast here on Vancouver Island, come check us out. Um, it's our s- little social enterprise <laughs> of selling uh, local handmade or um, ethically uh, derived goods um, in order to help us raise yeah. funding for the work we do. And, um, yeah, that's a good way to connect. Um, we're also going to be in Vancouver in June for a Patagonia event. June 16th. I'm looking at it right now. June 16th. So that would be something to check out too. Um, we have a couple films on our website that are definitely worth checking out. They're really, uh, magical. And we have a new film coming out in June as well. All about the Tranquil Project, All about actually. The Tranquil Project. So we've already spoken to that. So that's going to tie it in. So if you're interested in that, check out that film Yeah. in June. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And um, yeah, and and reach out too. Um, you can always send us an email, jessica at redfish.org or info at redfish.org um, to find out more, how you can get involved. Um, yeah. And we like one thing we're trying to do too is um, broaden our horizons and get out and do talks like this um, to universities. So if you're yeah. a university student and would like to um, bring myself or one of my colleagues out, um, that would be amazing. Yeah, I'm planning on chatting with Tom. I think either not this afternoon, but sometime this weekend. Oh, too. good, awesome. Tom's a fish biologist, and he's got a lot of good things to say. Yeah, you have to uh, talk to him about hatcheries. Oh, I will. Um. All right. Cool. Thanks, Jess. Um, Thank you, Ross. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for listening. (laughs) (laughs) Hasta luego. (laughs) All right. Lots of information there from Jess Hutchinson. Um, Again, if you would like to learn more about Redfish Restoration Society, the work that they do, and ways to support them, you can check them out at redfish.org. That's R-E-D-D-F-I-S-H dot org. So now I'm transitioning to a new segment of the podcast that I haven't done yet, um, where I answer questions from you. So if you're a Patreon supporter in the Humble Hemlock tier or higher, you can now submit questions that I will answer um, either as a video on Instagram or something or on this podcast. I'm doing this first one on this podcast because the question is a little bit complicated and I don't think I can you know, synthesize it and condense it down to just a one quick minute on Instagram. So... Today's question is from Patreon supporter Lori, with an IE, who asks, quote, What has truly allowed these massive trees to grow and live for so long? In Manitoba, I have hiked and biked and never come across such incredible majesty. End quote. So, um, little vag, I'm assuming she's uh, talking about the trees here in Cascadia in kind of western Turtle Island, um, these temperate, ro- temperate rainforest big trees that I spend a lot of time in because um, I can't quite picture Manitoban trees being that large. Then again, I've never been to Manitoba, but from everything that I know about ecology and everything, I don't, I don't really think there are too many big trees there. But anyway, um, so why do trees grow so big around here, this part of the world? Well, it's kind of a gray area. Um, 
So the height of a tree is limited by the amount of water that it can draw up through its xylem. So if you think about different water molecules, um, you know, like water elasticity, they form a chain of, of molecules um, that basically are sucked up the tree through the process of photosynthesis, creating a neg negative pressure gradient that draws water up from the bottom. Um, but the higher up that this chain of water molecules gets in the tree, you can imagine that the weight of the water connected to that, so that same kind of chain at the bottom is really heavy. So it's really fighting against the polar gravity in order to conduct this photosynthesis. And eventually it gets to a point when it just can no longer fight the force of gravity and that chain is broken, which means that there's no longer any photosynthesis that's uh, able to occur above that point. No more sugars are generated, no more carbohydrates, and the tree is not able to grow any more um, any higher than that point. So, you know, maybe on another planet where there was less gravity, less of that force pulling that water weight down, trees might be able to grow higher. But um, for now, here on Earth, that's kind of like the main limiting factor as to why they can only grow so high. Now, bonds between these water molecules, um, more often than not, are broken as the tree kind of grows above the canopy of the surrounding forest. So, um, you know, with ancient western red cedars, for example, as soon as they kind of grow up above the surrounding canopy, their leaders are exposed to all sorts of different um, winds and colder temperatures that ends up putting a lot more pressure and force on the tip of that tree, on that leader. So it snaps those, um, it snaps those kind of like veins in the xylem, if you will, a lot sooner. Um, so really, it's not as much about like, what can an, or how high can an individual tree grow by itself because the tree's height is kind of dictated by the surrounding forest you know so as one tree grows a little bit higher and is able to withstand those elements of the wind and, and the surrounding forces then it provides a little bit more shelter for the next tree to grow a little bit higher so the next one can grow a little bit higher than that so the forest as a whole kind of grows its height because one tree just on its own um, could never really grow to its full potential because it's just it succumbs to the forces around it far too early on so the second kind of measurement we tend to use for how big a tree is, is its diameter or its width. You know, how big of a base does, this, does a tree have? And this kind of differs per species of tree because trees are, are adapted to different locations, different regions, different environments, um, and they've all kind of evolved to be part of that. So, you know, as trees grow within different areas, there are different characteristics that are going to um, evolve out of that. So in places like um, Southern Australia, for example, you have mountain ash trees or eucalyptus regnans. Yeah. Yeah, eucalyptus regnans, which are these really beautiful, um, thin, tall, incredibly tall eucalyptus trees that grow up to be, I think, 120 meters tall. So massive trees, but they're never really that wide at the base compared to... Um, something like a giant sequoia, which doesn't grow to be as tall, but has a really wide stout base. And this stout base evolves um, as a way to kind of handle different elements that are thrown its way, whether it's different wind or snowpack or whatever it may be. Um, think of it kind of like an umbrella, like the thicker or the wider base of an umbrella stand you have, the more elements or the more wind that umbrella is going to be able to handle. It's kind of like that. And then there's old. So Lori mentions old in this question, and this is a different thing entirely because the the age of a tree tends to be limited by rot. So when we look at a tree, um, you know, really the only parts of it that are alive are the parts that we can see. You know, the bark or the cambium underneath that, the leaves that photosynthesize, and then the roots in the soil, and everything else is basically a skeleton of a support structure that keeps it standing upright and functioning. So then, as that skeleton ages, or the old wood inside the kind of heartwood of the tree ages, it becomes suspect to rot and disease, which eventually are going to bring it down, theoretically killing it or allowing it to take other shapes. And this is where, um, you know, we enter a gray area because one tree might fall over like a big western red cedar, for example, but then it's able to reiterate or um, grow new shoots and roots into the soil. Branches are able to reiterate and redirect themselves to become new leaders of the tree, even though it's fallen over. So it's like they might take on the shapes of different trees, but it's still technically the same organism living. Another really great example of this are aspens because aspens grow clonally. So you have um, you know, a grove of aspen trees that are all genetically the same. Technically, they're all the same organism. So if you cut down one of those trees or one of those trees falls over naturally, the organism itself can just grow a new one and continue growing even though those individual trees may not be that old. The organism itself, because it's kind of continually growing and renewing its cells and, and you know, keeping on living um, is basically, you know, much older than any of the individual trees. So again, it's a gray area. Basically, this whole thing is a gray area. It comes down to individual um, characteristics of different trees growing in different environments that allows them to grow differently. 
Um, and ultimately, I kind of feel like these questions in a sense, and no offense to you, Lori, like by any means, but I feel like this is just a funny thing that humans do where we try to put things into boxes. We're like, oh, how old is that? How high is that? Is that the widest tree? Is that the tallest tree? What is it? And and it's this very kind of like, I don't know, archaic way of like trying to organize things to establish a best, second, third, fourth. And all that really does ultimately is keep us from appreciating every tree in its unique individual shape. You know, like there are some amazing trees who may not be the tallest, the oldest, the widest, the thickest tree, like whatever, but it has this really cool crown that formed because it lost a branch in a storm back in 1996. And the, the, the crown has since twisted and kind of shaped to rebalance it. There's all these different things that happen um, to a tree along its life, that, a lifespan that kind of make it so cool and unique in its own way. And I feel like when we try to just simply throw things into boxes just to have like an, uh, an identified like, yes, this is the biggest, this is the widest, this is the tallest, that we lose all of the nuances of the really cool trees that are still out there, still living and growing and thriving in their own way, even though we don't have a way of necessarily appreciating that, if that makes any sense. Just another really quick thought on the subject, um, that it's important to note that all forests are really important regardless of what species of tree they are, um, how big those trees are, how grand or magnificent they may look on a postcard or on Instagram. Um, you know, as great and grand and glorious and big and old and amazing as all the forests in, you know, Western British Columbia, Cascadia bioregion really are, um, they're, you know, they serve a certain ecological role within that bioregion, but that doesn't make them any greater or worse than the forests in Manitoba or anywhere else in the world. Like all these forests, um, na native forests, regardless of where you are in the world, are something that we should all try to find majesty and beauty in, even if they're not these, these kind of like big grand trees that we found a way to idolize through social media posts or just this idea of grand or biggest being the best thing out there. Because in reality, all these forests are equally important. So in conclusion, I don't really have a definitive answer for you here. It's kind of a gray area as to why these trees grow so big, um, other than the fact that they've just evolved to do so in this environment because of everything that this environment offers. And we can go into, um, you know, the weather patterns and geography of the area, how there are certain hillsides that will protect a certain grove that allows them to grow bigger. Um, the amount of moisture um, in the area that trees like Western Red Cedars absolutely love. There are all sorts of these different factors that contribute to these trees growing as large as they do, but ultimately they've evolved to do that because this ecosystem has allowed them to grow that big in the first place. So I hope that little ramble um, helped you somehow at least kind of understand the concepts of the limiting factors of growth and why trees grow to be as big as they do. Um, so if you have any questions about nature or trees or myself, anything you want to ask, you can do so at patreon.com slash nerdyaboutnature where you can sign up to become a Patreon if you're not one already. Um, and again, in the humble hemlock and higher tier, you have the ability to ask questions to which I'm going to answer on videos on Instagram, this podcast, or maybe even reply to you directly depending on the question. Um, so you can do that. Again, Nerdy About Nature is an independent passion project and maintaining my independence here is really important to me because it means I can say whatever I want, do whatever I want with it. Um, I'm able to bring up information that nobody wants to talk about and, and do so in a way where I'm not, you know, operating out of fear of losing a sponsor or making somebody mad or even worse, having someone trying to tell me what to say or, or say things that I don't necessarily agree with. Like, I don't want to have to sell out in order to make that happen. So if you appreciate this podcast and um, the videos and everything that I'm doing here, I would really appreciate your support on Patreon. And you know what, if it's just not a priority for you right now, or you don't have the funds, or you just feel like, you know, you got other things going on, no worries. I'm just stoked that you all are here. Um, I'm going to keep on keeping on doing this thing and trying to make it work. Um, and if you want to support me along the way at some point, cool. If not, no worries. Let's all just keep hanging out, having these good conversations together here, learning, growing, creating a better world in the future. So having said all of that, thank you all again, once again, for joining me on this Nerdy About Nature podcast episode. Um, I hope to catch you all here in a couple weeks. So we'll have another guest lined up and some really great conversations. So stay tuned and take care. <laughs>